Cheryl, where did you sleep last night? On the streets. When you say on the streets, what does that mean? On the streets at night, like what do you do? Walk around, stand in the bank, stand in stairwells of buildings. You don't actually sleep then? Sometimes in laundry rooms. Laundry rooms, like... Uh, in buildings. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Until somebody finds you and kicks you out? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Oh, what, you sleep on the floor? Mm-hmm, and curled up in front of the radiator. Michael, you own guns. That is correct. Do you carry guns when you go out, when you leave the home? Absolutely. I, I How many? Carry, I carry two handguns on me. Why? Why? Because that's, that's my right. Even when you're, like, on a day off, if you were going grocery shopping, would you have a gun? Absolutely. Ren, you are hitting puberty. Are, are you taking drugs? Well, not bad drugs, but um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I do take um, Lupron. And what does that do? Well, if you had already gone through puberty, which you do have to a bit, which I find is kind of weird, it prevents you from going through any further puberty, and it kind of reduces the effects of the puberty that you've already been through. How important is that for you, Ren? Well, if I didn't have that, I don't think I would be able to be a boy, so... When I came home that same evening, I was going to a prayer meeting uh, the same night. I opened my TV, uh, as I always do, and uh, then uh, when I heard that horrible uh, event in uh, Polytechnic, I thought it was just horrible, you know, and I felt something very strong for the mother. And when I went to the prayer meeting, I asked that we prayed for the mother, not knowing that it was me. To pray for the mother of the killer? Yeah. yeah. And you didn't know it was you? I didn't know. I... Lots of different voices there. What'd you think? You know, people tell me the most amazing things. They tell me their stories, they tell me what they think. They tell me how they think. They even tell me things they don't expect to tell me. Every day, I have a whole bunch of conversations that unfold in public, and I talk to people about their stories, about their fears, about their experiences, about their controversies. You might think that I talk for a living, but my real job is to listen. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. I want to take you on my journey, which begins with the sound that's in my head that goes into your ears. And it's a journey of asking and listening in an attempt to get answers and understanding so I can try to connect the dots between those little moments and the big events so we can try to understand what's going on in our big world. And maybe we'll learn to think and even think differently about what's happening out there. Now, What's so magical about listening? To be a journalist and to listen is to do a lot of work. After all, you're on a mission to get information. You want to learn something new. You want to clarify something. You want to hold someone to account. But you can't do any of that if you don't first get them to open up. So you get them to open up and talk to you. And then you have to follow up and react and keep the conversation going and keep looking for information and stay focused. But you won't do any of that if you don't really hear what they're saying. And when you truly listen, that's when the answers to the questions can take me and you in a direction that I don't expect and help me learn something. I'll give you an example. Sherry Cooper was a top Canadian female banking executive. She was the chief economist of BMO. And I remember seeing her on television when no one was putting women on TV to provide economic and financial analysis. So I was really inspired by her. So when she announced that she was retiring, I wanted to talk to her about her big job and her huge success. I wanted to know what we could learn from her career. Halfway through that interview, I asked her a very simple, basic question. As you kept going on in the business world, when did you know or realize that you had broken through? I haven't broken through. I now I know that sounds crazy, but I haven't broken through in the sense that I was typecast from the beginning as the economist. And I say that because no one ever considered that I could be in training for a C-suite job in the bank. 
Brent C-suite Leiber means what? Means, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, CEO or the head of um, operational units within the bank. I say that because just before I came to Canada, Grant Ryber had been chief economist of the Bank of Montreal, and he went on to become president. So when I say that I haven't broken through, it's not that I aspired to be chief executive of one of the banks. It's just that I was never even considered in that role. But are you saying that essentially that we I mean, we began by talking about being a woman who's essentially a trailblazer in this industry because there were so few of you when you started that you, too, hit a glass ceiling? Yes. Yes. Did you hear that surprise? Were you surprised to hear that a woman who got that far still hit the glass ceiling? If you were surprised, you were with me. And that's my goal. When I'm talking to someone, I want you to be the third person in the room. There's me, the person I'm talking to, and you. And you're right there with us. And if I'm really listening, you will be there. And if I'm not, you won't care so much about that conversation. Got another example. I'm in the studio with Christine Barnett and her son, Jacob. Jacob is autistic. And when he was very young, Christine and her husband were told, he'll never be able to communicate with you. Be grateful if he even learns to tie his shoes by himself. But Christine felt there was something going on in Jacob's mind and she wanted to help him unlock it. And as she tried to do that, she began to learn what we need to pay attention to when it comes to autistic children. Listen to this. Every single time, things that seem like repetitive, nonsensical or meaningless behaviors, things like twisting a ball in space or holding on to a pen and turning it if you pay very close attention, often the precision is a hint to sort of a mathematical mind. And I like to say that children with autism sort of know this beautiful place where math, science, and art all converge. They can't always communicate it, but that's what they're doing. Jake, you are looking at the the um, the cord to the thing, <laughs> but but you're actually like when you move it around, you look at the shadow differently. What do you see that I wouldn't see in the shadows? Um, you can see each of the different lights just by looking at the table. So if you look closely, if I sort of stretch it, um, I can see there's two sort of frequencies here. And I can see, say, one chord here, and I can see one here, and one here, and one here, and one here. And they, e they each have different um, amounts of shade, so you can determine the distance to the light and the angle to the light as well. <laughs> I need to look at them differently. The lights above us? Yeah. Oh, I learned something new all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a conversation of discovery, even for his mother. We were listening, and we asked, and we listened again. He's looking at the cord of the headphones, the coiled cord, and he's doing the equation from the way the light hits it. Jacob, by the way, was about 15 when he came in the studio. He was functioning at the, the level of a PhD candidate in astrophysics. And suddenly when you hear this, you realize it's more than just the story of one autistic child. It's about what can be unlocked from the silence of an autistic child. And that becomes really important because at a time when so many children are being diagnosed on the autism spectrum, we need to understand what that silence has the potential to be. You know, we talk about silence and I talk about what I learned by listening. Sometimes I learn a lot from what I don't hear. We were covering the war in Bosnia, and we were driving in our armored car down a rural road, and the car breaks down. It's a truck. It's a big lumbering truck. And we all jump out. Somebody lifts the hood, and I'm standing around, and I, I don't hear anything. And I say, wow, it's not very quiet here. It's so peaceful. Isn't that great? And just as I said that, this UN truck comes up, and it stops next to us, and it says, get back in your truck. We'll tow you out of here. And so they do, and they get us to some place where we can fix the truck, and then they say, don't do that again. You were in the no man's land. You were in a sniper zone. We guarantee you there were three snipers who had you in their sights. So the lesson, of course, is you don't hang out in the no man's land between the warring factions, and you listen for the message in what you don't hear. It's quiet because it's a sniper zone. Something else when we talk about silence, I'm not sure I should even tell you this, but silence is one of my best tools as an interviewer, especially when it comes to accountability interviews. Because if I ask a question and then say nothing, the person I'm interviewing will feel obliged to say something. 
I've learned that my sub interview subjects are always more afraid of dead air than I am. Now, let's stay with silence. I want to play another clip for you with some silence in it. This is a clip of May Harar. You'll remember May Harar, Canadian citizen of Syrian descent. He is on vacation in Tunis. He flies home, transits New York. The Americans grab him. They send him back to the Middle East. He ends up in a Syrian prison under a U.S. rendition program. He's tortured for more than a year by the Syrians for the CIA on the strength of information that was given them by the RCMP. The interview you're about to hear happens the day after the inquiry is released that says what happened to Meher Arar was wrong and that the RCMP had a hand in it. Now, I can't see Meher Arar. He's in the Ottawa studio. I'm in Toronto. He's sitting there with his lawyer and the conversation's almost over. What will you tell your kids as they grow up um, about all of this? You know, my daughter is almost 10 years old, and um, when I come back to Kamloops next week, I will not tell her about the fact that she was placed on this list. My kids have gone through so much so far. They have... Uh, It's still very painful. You may hear a roar. I won't, um, I won't insist that you keep talking about this. I know it's very hard. I appreciate you coming in and talking to us today. Thank you both for speaking to me today. Thank you. What did you hear in that silence? Emotion? That raw, awkward attempt to try to compose yourself? You heard his mind working. And in that moment, you learned and I learned in a really visceral way that what happened to May Harar, he still carries with him. He still has to confront. And so this becomes a lesson beyond May Harar about the human condition. You know, stuff ends, inquiries come to an end, and we all move on, especially in the news. But the people who are involved, they need time. They carry that with them. I'm going to stick with the issue of Syria for a moment because fast forward to today and you know there's a terrible civil war underway in Syria. And I think it's really important to talk to people about their individual experiences so that we really understand what a war does to people, the, the human cost of war. I interviewed a woman by the name of Zaina Erheim. She is a Syrian. She's chosen to stay and live in Aleppo. She doesn't have to. She and her husband live there. She's documenting what's going on in Aleppo. She's doing documentaries on the women who are caught in the war. And we're having this wide-ranging conversation, and it's going on and on. But there's a piece of information I know. I know that Zaina, at the age of 30, has decided with her husband they will never have kids because they cannot bring a child into this terribly violent world. And I know this because I've read it. And I want her to talk about it. I don't really know quite how to ask it, and we're running out of time. But I really, I know the answer, but I want her to say it. Listen to what happens. People are still having children. They're still trying to live their lives. They are still, but those children are born stateless. They don't have IDs. They are not recognized, and they are not existed. Uh, have you thought about children? Yep. I'm on my way. You're on your way. You're pregnant. Yeah. Yeah? Yep. Okay, I was not expecting that answer. And she wasn't going to go there. But in that moment, she is no longer Zaina, the documentary maker, the courageous documentary maker. She is also Zaina, the mom, trying to figure out how she's going to live her life and take care of her kid. And in that moment, the war in Syria changes for us, too, because she embodies our worst fears and vulnerabilities. And the war in Syria takes on a different tone beyond the faceless fighters of ISIS and rebels and government. And it goes and speaks to the individuals and their little babies who are caught in that madness. I call that the heartbeat of a story. And I listen for that as well. Because every story has a heartbeat. From the driest of economic stories to the most intractable conflict and I think that as journalists, it's our responsibility to seek out the people who are affected by what's going on and have them tell their stories to us so that we can understand what it really means on the ground. 
And that, by the way, is why I believe in journalistic accountability. I believe in holding the people who make decisions to account. We need to hear why they do what they do. They need to justify it or at least talk about it. And that means elected officials, appointed officials. That means people who have power and influence as, over us by virtue of their corporate wealth and power. I think it's really important that we listen to them and that we ask questions of them. And that, by the way, is why I believe in the future of journalism. Now, you might have noticed these days, not a lot of people believe in the future of journalism. They kind of think we should just give up. And you've heard all the stories. The business model doesn't work. We've dumbed it down. It's just clickbait. Nobody wants more than clickbait. Nobody cares. But I'm here to tell you that I believe that people do care, that the search for truth and accountability, that the delight in hearing a story, that the need to understand, that the interest in learning something new and even in listening in, all of that is age old. And that's what journalism does. We can't just give up on that. We can't just walk away from that. We have to find a way. If the business model doesn't work, we have to find a better one. If we have dumbed it down and sold it out, we have to take it back. People want to know what's going on, and if we listen to them, we will be able to find a way forward. Now, I came here today to tell you what I've listened, learned by listening as a journalist. One of the things I've learned that it is that it's not about me, that it's about the people whose stories we need to hear, and I need to make space to hear them. Because if I listen, the people to whom I'm talking will inspire me and educate me and empower me. Sometimes they'll infuriate me. Sometimes they will make me smile. And many times they will make me weep. And always I will come away learning something. And I've also learned that the public, the listening public, and that would be you, that you're as smart as I think you are. And if we offer you stories that are complex with voices and people who have things to say that you can listen to, you will listen and you will learn too. And I want to thank you for listening to me today. Thank you.